Hello, hello, how's it going everyone? Happy Friday. Hope we're all having a very partable Friday. Today we have a very special treat. We'll be doing a public policy stream. I haven't done a fart lecture in a while. I think the last one I did was on the German revolutions of 1848. So that's been quite a bit, at least a year, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll have to go check the YouTube. And um, maybe, maybe if I like look it up on my own channel, it'll probably tell me because I think I uploaded the last fart lecture. If I didn't, I hope that I still have the VOD somewhere, but um, hopefully this uh, VOD won't have any uh, copyright strikes or weird non-copyrighted music being played and parts of the audio get muted. That's always annoying, I think, when like Twitch mutes part of the audio in the VOD and then you go to export it and then you try to upload it to YouTube and then it's like it gets auto striked even though like you weren't aware of there being like copyrighted music in a freaking 24 hour playlist, but that's that's beside the point. Hopefully, uh, this video should be good to go on YouTube. But yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, California gambling regulation. Uh, I try to have a little bit of a mix between general uh, gambling regulation in, in California, as well as a little bit of a focus on gotcha games, uh, video game microtransactions, loot boxes, esports betting, um, and esports in general, because uh, I know that a lot of us here play gacha games. Uh, I know Mahoyo is in a lot of contention, as well as um, Activision Blizzard um, being one of the main perpetrators of why loot boxes are kind of uh, antagonized in a global context, especially with some countries outright banning Overwatch just because it had loot boxes, which I find extremely strange considering that like Aces and CSGO cases, TF2 cases, Steam markets in general have just had them for decades. That's neither here or there, uh, but we will be talking about that later. Um, also, in today's stream, uh, it'll be um, kind of luxury with the PowerPoint, but feel free to like talk and chat. Uh, I'll answer any questions as we go along. And um, also, if uh, you guys need to head out or need to like dip for any reason, uh, the VOD will be up for, on Twitch for probably a good two months, as well as on YouTube. And I can't wait to re-reference it whenever I need to. Uh, and also, there is a longer and detailed report uh, that accompanies this. Uh, exclamation point report goes into the Google Doc. You guys can read it for yourselves. It's, it's going to be a lot more detailed, a lot more accurate, and um, a lot more nitty gritty with the numbers as well. Uh, I create a few data matrices here and there, as well as really lay out what's going on with some of these gambling interest industries. So hopefully, uh, in addition to this, like a uh, little lecture stream that we're doing and this report, uh, you guys will come out uh, being somewhat more experts on California gambling regulation, as well as uh, recognizing what is legal and what is illegal in the gotcha games. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I played a ton of gotcha games growing up. I played FGO played Effie Heroes, or even read the Fates, uh, like visual novels and stuff. I remember reading Stay Night, or I read the first one in Japanese. That was pretty cool. And then when the whole like gacha game came out with FGO, that was really cool because like it, it had all the Fate universes in it, like Apocrypha, Stay Night, Zero, and all that. And uh, oh my god, I think um, I think everyone also played Club Penguin as well, and that was like one of the first like really nitty-gritty kid games that had like uh, subscription services oh and then there was also freaking toontown as well where you had that subscription service model i don't really remember what was like the first game i played that was like overtly made money off of just the loot box system that could be considered a gotcha game so i think tf2 and cs like go probably makes a good running for it but even like back then when CSGO came out, it was like, I don't think people batted an eye because people just accepted it as gambling. But I also think that like, uh, it didn't receive as much legal flack because of the fact that like, it was very new and people didn't know what to make of it. I think that's even true to this day that like a lot of, uh, of the California legislature, parents in general, and like uh, some people of the older generation, they just like, they don't give a rat's ass about what's happening in the video game industry, despite like, you know, all these gambling products coming out, especially overseas. There's a huge uh, gambling culture in, in video games in 
know, uh, Japan and China, especially all the gacha games, which are the main perpetrators. But yeah, we'll talk about uh, all of that uh, in the stream. But uh, as always, if you guys um, have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll try to answer them as we go. As well as uh, if you need to say hi or anything, or just want to socialize, feel free to socialize in chat, and uh, I'll I'll read them as we go along, just like a normal stream. We'll be like I'll still be very chill and laid back. Also, um, if any of you guys have played like uh, the Hoyaverse games, like Honkai Star Rail, Genshin Impact, um, uh, Honkai Impact. All, all of those, like, if you guys have, like, personal experiences about the gambling system or if you have thoughts, feel free to voice them. Safe space. Uh, I aim to be, like, a little bit more, like, you know, academic political uh, in the stream, so not really taking one side or the other. Uh, we're not here to bash on the people that do play, you know, uh, the Hoyoverse games. We're not trying to bash people who do play gacha games. Um, feel free to play whatever game you want. But uh, I'm just presenting the facts. Uh, presenting the policy choices that uh, countries have made, that the U.S. has made, and uh, it's up to you guys to like you know make your own opinion. So I'm not here to sway you on one way or the other. I'm just here to present the facts as I see them and from what my research shows. And uh, I should have included a bibliography slide for that exact reason, but um, a more detailed bibliography down in the, uh, the report exclamation point report for those of you just joining us. Yeah, hang on. Let's see if everything works. Hopefully, hopefully. I tested a few things before we went, and it's so nice that I have the um, the academic school overlay in a classroom because I feel like uh, back when I did like regular lectures on this channel, I um, the school theme really fit. But then after that, I was like, it was just a Warhammer, and I'm like, huh, I kind of want to get a Warhammer theme and overlay for my stream. But like, also, oh, I might I might go back to uh, doing regular lectures. Yeah, it's been a while since I've done a lecture, so might be a bit rusty, but we'll see how we go. Uh, we also got, I should probably also provide this uh, PowerPoint in the server. I think it's pretty funny. We got a little bit of comedy here and there, uh, but guilty as charged. I was in um, a Viva Nora stream earlier, and like because I don't play Genshin Impact very regularly, I had to ask her in her chat about freaking uh, Genshin characters and which ones. Like, they, I just had them name them randomly, and I just put the the first few that, like, they talked about, just so it includes some more Genshin representation and stuff. And of course, R6 is a little bit of a gotcha game with microtransactions, so include Lion from R6. It really doesn't fit the bill. I should have had it a little bit of a wider spread, but, you know, big YOLO. But anyway, the title of the report, as well as this presentation, is uh, The Hoyo's War, Future of Gambling Regulation in California. Uh, I picked California in particular because that's my uh, specialization in terms of like the public policy knowledge of gambling regulation. I know a little bit about the federal gambling regulation, um, mostly for um, policies that have to align from state to countrywide, as well as a little bit of the international sphere because um, tribal and native affairs, they're obviously uh, uh, Delta as a foreign entity, as well as most gacha games that are developed in Asia, they're they're all international law. Yo, how's it going, Silent Wolf? How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Do you play any gacha games, by the way? Yeah, Firestream indeed. We got you know Ganyu, Kaching, Zhongli, Lisa, Big Epic. What gacha games do you play? Super cool, Mr. David. Do you have any personal experiences with uh, gambling addiction from any of these gacha games? Big Epic, Big Epic. Uh, but anyway, a little bit of an introduction to today's uh, gambling topic. Uh, there's large stakes invested actually in um, trying to have preventative gambling measures, but more so for you know the traditional gambling that we see uh, in American society. Casino gamblers, uh, scratch ticket gamblers, people that do a bunch of betting on sports, underground gambling and stuff like that. And it's become a larger problem mainly due to uh, COVID and the digital gambling sources that are available because people that know that uh, a lot of gambling varieties are illegal in California kids just you know use a VPN use their parents credit card and they, they go and do their wagers and it's always it's also been a problem I think for any game that has a loot box and you know a kid's asking hey can I have like 10 bucks for a game or something they're buying you know fucking five keys and unboxing shit so it's been, a, it's been a problem for a while, and I think that the digital space and COVID has kind of aggravated those problems. But also, uh, California itself as a state is becoming an emerging gambling hub. 
because it used to be on the west coast at least the main gambling hub las vegas and that's been like embedded into american culture like you know we have sayings like oh what happens in vegas stays in vegas but as of 2000 when um the california constitution was amended to legalize certain gambling facets um california as it since it's a really large and growing economy it's able to really foster a lot more gambling variations as well as foster gambling in general and businesses card rooms tribal casinos horse racing tracks all of that and it's had a long history in california believe it or not despite it only being legal for the past 20 30 years but mainly because uh they went from being small social things to a little bit more cultural during you know, the 1900s, 1930s, to being full-fledged industries for what we see today. And it is a politicized issue, as we saw from the recent um, voting in 2022. Uh, for those non-Californians, we voted on Prop 23 and 24, which would decide if we could legalize sports betting online or legalize sports betting uh, in person in casinos. And this was really important because New Jersey legalized sports betting itself in its state. So did Nevada and so did a few of our other neighbors. So it was California's turn to see if it would um, come to pass. And uh, a lot of the funding was supposed to go toward public works, solving the homelessness problem. Um, but both propositions actually failed. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why. But we can see that in today's kind of political climate in California, the general California public, we can we can discern that there's a lot of uh, anti-gambling sentiments. So it's strange that we have giant population in California uh, and they uh, have huge anti-gambling sentiments, yet there's not a lot of research for education purposes on exploitive gotcha games, exploitive gambling mechanics in video games, um, everything from, you know, sports trading cards that require rolling slots in FIFA to fucking like, you know, the Hoyo games, uh, loot boxes, Apex Legends, CSGO, even like doing uh, free loot boxes like uh, League of Legends does, like, you know, with your Prime box, you get a free loot box and you can get some in-game materials. You got a lot of softcore gambling mechanics coming into uh, the normal mainstream video games here. And that is becoming the new like meta for how these game industries are uh, trying to have long-term sustainable income for their games. And I'm not um, big into like the video game industry politics or video game industry like models of how they try to generate revenue. Maybe I'll ask um, Risa later to like uh, give her views on it. And I could have a little addendum to the bottom of like the Discord announcement. But I, I feel like it'd be a little bit interesting to see how like game devs feel about it. I remember back in the day, like, you know, Dragon Age Origins when they made games to be fun and not like uh, they make a yearly triple A game that's really horrid at 70 bucks and has loot boxes and microtransactions everywhere. But yeah, the um, big thing, though, about the gotcha games is that it's I wouldn't say it's like localized to our generation because it spills over a little bit into the previous one, but it's definitely like uh, within the last decade or so development and the wider american community i feel like isn't really understands or comprehends how big the industry is but i think our generation like most of us play games so the fact that like the american legislature is not very into this topic or and or not very aware of this topic it, it's going to lead to a lot of problems when you know 10 20 years from now when our generation is the one you know running the government and we have to create the policy for how these gotcha games need to be regulated or if they need to be regulated. Because in some countries, they, they just don't have regulation. We, we, we get shit like Raid Shadow Legends. Maybe you guys have played that. But in other countries, you know, like Belgium, they have very strict gambling laws where uh, loot boxes and games with loot boxes are straight up banned. So we have a really dynamic spread across the board and it's also really important for the fact that there's a lot of game development companies in California that like ship globally recognized games like Overwatch is an Irvine. Um, I think we have a Bioware office here. Steam is here. Um, I, don't, I don't know where Apex is. I think it might also be Irvine, but they have a lot of, I think, sway and they could be affected a lot by public policy and legislature decisions. 
And another big thing that like uh, is a bit worrisome about the California gambling regulation sphere is that it's a really fragmented and a flawed policy system. Uh, you would think that we would have one government agency regulating gambling in California, such as like the California Gambling Control Commission, which is what we have. But uh, when the legislature started legalizing gambling, they did it on a game by game basis and then created eight different agencies as well as put different agencies in charge of each game. So poker regulated differently than tribal gambling, regulated differently than horse racing, regulated differently than uh, card rooms, regulated differently than uh, nonprofit organizations and stuff like that. So what we have is a huge, huge network of state and federal agencies. So there's like a mix of conflicting interests as well as expertise coming into the policy sphere here. And because of this fragmented system, there is no one unified response when push comes to shove or a test is created into the policy system. So when we have something like gotcha games and we have nine different agencies that may have a stake and or may have, you know, a uh, vested interest or the ability to regulate that said gotcha game, it, it's going to be a shit show no matter what. So I'm, I also have the end of this presentation a few recommendations I would have for uh, California gambling regulation, but we have a very fragmented system in California. It's not the best. Um, it's very nuanced and complex. Does it need to be nuanced and complex? Well, I'm gonna, I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit and see if it like actually is a working system. But uh, some of the developing problems in uh, gambling regulation here in California. Also, there's a picture of me next to the California State Lottery machine while I was in LA, it's big epic. Got my Warhammer bag. Got my two Celsiuses for AX, big epic. Um, there's a lot more electronic gambling, as I said before, especially after COVID. More people, um, you know, can't go online for their uh, casino game. They, they don't they can't go in person for their casino games. They have to resort to online games. They play like stuff like pure play poker and stuff like that. Um, gotcha games are really prevalent. The boxes, as I said before. Um, and there's a lot of cash flow that goes from stuff like the California State Lottery that's supposedly supposed to go toward our public works. Um, like the Cal State Lottery uh, funds our roads in California. And every time I tell that to one of my friends, they're like, really now, where is that fucking road money going towards? And it's probably going to like interstate highways and stuff, not specific cities, but there's a huge cash flow. Uh, it's not regulated very well. It's also unclear uh how the denominations go toward um so when we go into like the flow chart i made later uh you'll see that there's a ton of money but it's unclear also like how it's broken down and you get instances where we get 1.8 billion that goes towards roads but our roads are still shit but there's also you know uh, 8.3 million that goes to tribes and there are some tribes that are like still on reservations without electricity and other tribes where they're paying their tribal members thirty thousand dollars a month um, but as I said earlier, there's a, it's a fragmented policy system. So when a development occurs, it's a very difficult process in order for anything to happen, especially in terms of rulemaking and trying to make uh, denuded rules to help address problems in the public. Definitely not a COVID response. And also there's a little bit of a trade-off for tribal self-sufficiency because some tribes, as I said before, they live in very poor economic conditions. Uh, probably because their allotted land uh, on their reservations was poor to begin with, didn't have an economic uh, value, and some really poor tribes. Yeah, exactly. Stinking gambling. How's it going, Faye? Do you play any gotcha games, by the way, Faye? Would you consider Warhammer a gotcha game, Big Epic? How you doing, by the way, Hamlin? Give you a sniff. Hell no, that's that's what we like to. Oh my god, 88%. That's extreme stinky. Man. How you doing, by the way? You doing well, Faye? Happy Fartable Fridays. But as I was saying, a lot of these Native American tribes, some of them live in extreme poverty, but others have been able to build casinos and then turn their land into fortunes by having no economic value. This is a huge wealth disparity for tr some tribes, and some tribes have been very noble about it. You know, they use their extra casino revenue to donate back to the city, finance public works. Others, um, there's a little bit of political corruption and stuff, and they use a lot of their money for political power. 
Ooh, very good to hear that you're good. And um, some call it that there's an emergence of special interest monopolies. Warhammer's a money sink, no gotcha about it. Well, we might talk about this later, um, but there is a discussion of whether or not uh, tabletop card games are gambling or not, because you pay for the cards and you could get the individual ones, but the intent from the business is that you pay for a packs of cards and there are chances you have the ones that you want. Now, it's a gamble now in Warhammer where you buy the fucking models <laughs> and it's a gamble whether or not they're going to be still good within the same like three months of the edition. So in that way, it's also a pretty funny gamble and a money sink. But anyway, uh, there's also the growing problem of a rising video game industry. It's, it's as big as it's ever been. Yeah, it really is the tabletop card game scene in general. Especially because that's like, you know, their business model and how it's always been. But there might be, you know, evolving legislation around that, you know, with our, within our generation, if they become, you know, big policy makers. The big sinkers that have been done dirty by Magic the Gathering. I could see it, I could see it. But the video game industry is huge as well as it's an international business at this point. You know, Irvine, uh, uh, Blizzard Entertainment in Irvine is not very localized to just California. It's a global entity got esports leagues all over the country hearthstone in hong kong is huge and we're not only like uh in a little, a little bit of like a fork in terms of do we want to regulate the companies in california because they might go elsewhere and we're losing revenue from the state but also at what point do we want to step in and say hey those business practices are exploitive you're making money off of children <laughs> doing exploitive gambling and stuff like that and it's kind of like a little bit of the policy that we have to consider today. Uh, but here are the legalized gambling types in California uh, and the varieties. We have tribal gam gaming. So any uh, casino that you guys see uh, is most likely on tribal land in California. And uh, they're legally allowed to do that uh, as long as they have a license. Uh, we have the California State Lottery or Cal Lotto, which believe it or not is a form of gambling and it's sponsored by the state. And it, hypothetically, all the proceeds go toward funding public works and roads. If you guys live near an area where the roads aren't very good, then maybe ask the California State Lottery Commission. Hopefully they'll fix it. Uh, card rooms, uh, if you guys have seen like just rooms that said like Blackjack, Baccarat 21, all that. Uh, there's been a debate whether or not poker needs to be banned in California or not, which I find weird because you can play them in most casinos, but that's... Uh, that's an issue for another time, I think. I think it's also probably because if they ban poker, it's like game over for a lot of card games here. Uh, horse racing, which has had a huge history in California, uh, way, way, way in the um, days where we were still a Spanish territory, they were racing horses, uh, but f like officially recognizing it as a uh, wager-based uh, gambling activity comes much later, like 1930. And also charities and nonprofit organizations that do fundraisers in the form of like bingo, card nights, uh, universities that do like uh, gambling games as well. All of those fall into those as well. And um, believe it or not too, the uh, major league sports are allowed to do charity raffles called 50-50s, uh, where um, a 50-50 raffle is where half of the proceeds go to a winner. So maybe uh, at an NFL game, they'll be like, oh, donate, however much money uh, and you get a raffle ticket and if you win the raffle you get half of the pot and the other half of the pot goes toward charitable organizations major league sports organizations not clear which but uh, we presume the mlb nfl it's broad can do these and it's straight up gambling so if you think about it too if uh so esports is uh, known as a major league sport now in california major leagues uh, esports can now do a straight up gambling stuff uh, in their uh, events, which might be really, really funny. I'd be like flabbergasted. We go to AX, we go to the Mahoya booth, boom, they have like an esport League of Legends tournament or something where like you have the gotcha chance to win a bunch of like pop money. I think that'd be funny. But notice that um, esports betting, sports betting, and online gambling not outright legalized in California. And there's a lot of pushback to um it was not legalized in the recent 2022 uh voting so i think that is also a uh something to consider too for the future of esports betting 
especially because if sports betting is not going to be legalized and esports are considered a sport in California specifically, oh, we might have some like pushback as well for that industry trying to get uh, a little bit more in on the action because in other states it's legal to, to bet on esports such as Nevada. But it's, it is weird that, you know, the home of the LCS is in LA, but that state itself is not making any uh, profits off of, you know, the betting that's happening. And the people that do probably participate in the bets are using VPNs and stuff. So we are, we are, we as the state are not benefiting off of it. Um, but here's a little bit of a flowchart. Hopefully it's visible um, on the screen and you can read all the text, but I made this uh, kind of matrix about the, the size of the gambling sector and kind of the revenues generated um, after winnings from their gamblings, as well as what they uh, allocate to administrative costs and also what their revenue is in addition to what they might give toward the state general fund or certain charities and stuff. Uh, and we have the five different types of gambling institutions uh, listed on this left column. So tribal gambling, state lottery, card rooms, horse racing, and the charities. Um, as you can notice, there is a large, large amount of agencies that are in charge of regulating these entities. And it is neither uniform, nor is it uh, clear, for some of them it's clear, on why it's only these entities that are regulating these institutions. So we're tribal game play, uh, gaming, uh, and I explain all the acronyms in the report, exclamation point report, uh, for those of you that don't have it. Um, but I'll, I'll talk through some of them. So tribal gaming is regulated by the California Gambling Control Commission, Bureau of Gambling Control, which is the federal entity, not the state entity, uh, the Department of Justice, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is the federal one, and the National Indian Gaming Commission, uh, also the federal one. So we have a mix of state and federal interests uh, in just in this area. And it's very... Uh, because it deals with international law, it makes sense that it has to deal with a bunch of federal entities, uh, especially because uh, they're not considered, some of the, the employees and those that are citizenship, citizenship in California, they can be considered to be you know regulated by California, but all in all, they're on tribal lands, they're considered you know a different state, different nation all of themselves. Um, as you know, tribal gaming, casinos, all that, it's a very large industry. Uh, 8 billion generated in 2018 to 2019. I chose that, those specific years. So we can get an idea of what it looks like before COVID, what what it looks like typically. It's probably a little bit more recovered now, um, but in California in particular, what we try to do, it looks like the legislature wants to be, if you're an entity being regulated uh, by a California agency or a federal agency, uh, part of your revenue goes toward administrative costs of regulating you. Uh, so travel gaming pays 33 million to administrative costs, looks good. Um, but what's really interesting about tribal gaming is that 3.6 million of it, uh, of all the tribes, uh, casinos go toward um, a TGNF fund, tribal gaming national fund, which basically goes toward poor tribes in uh, California that couldn't afford to um, sustain themselves. Uh, increases their self-sufficiency, all of that, especially those that can't open casinos themselves and or those that aren't federally recognized. Because um, not all, Indi all Indian tribes are federally recognized and it's actually a really long process. Some people pay like, you know, $17 million and have like five-year court battles just to be federally recognized, even though they have like 16 pages of evidence and stuff like that. But um, that's like a whole, you know, Indian affair issue. So there's a lot of tribes in California and all of them are federally recognized. We also have the California State Lottery, as I mentioned earlier, and it's um, a five member uh, lottery commission. And those five people are appointed by the governor. So the office of the governor is actively dealing with the California State Lottery. And it's mainly these two entities because they decide to use the money for public works and stuff like that. State general fund and whatnot. Huge administrative costs. Also, a huge amount that goes toward public work because that was the intent of the creation of the agency. Um, but interestingly enough, California Gambling Control Commission not involved, which I found really weird considering they do consider the lottery as gambling. And it's in the California Constitution that California State Lottery is gambling. Uh, card rooms uh, regulated by the Federal Bureau of Gambling Control as well as the California Gambling Control Commission um, across the board makes a lot of money. Uh, they pay income tax 
That's something I also didn't uh, mention. Uh, casinos don't pay taxes because they're you know it's a sovereign entity. What they do pay in terms of taxes is employment taxes. Uh, they don't pay property taxes. It's on their own land. But they do pay sales tax if they're selling goods like you know sodas in their restaurants. If they're sourcing food from uh, outside their tribal lands, that's that's the taxes they pay. But it's not specifically meant that they're they're paying taxes. They're paying like conventional California business taxes. Uh, but income taxes from card rooms, since they're they're treated as a business, that's where their main revenue goes toward the government. Horse racing, another interesting one because it's not regulated by federal entities and or the state California Gambling Control Commission. I find that also very interesting. And it's mostly because I think that horse racing has been a a lot um around for a while that we don't have like a unified gambling control commission regulating that entity or the intent of the legislature when they created uh, a horse racing board was that it wasn't gambling or like wagers on it have been there for a while and we didn't consider wagers on it to be uh, part of the, like the overall gambling policy scheme in California. Uh, still a large industry as you can see 660 million uh, they pay business and income taxes and that's where uh, their contribution to the government owes to and interestingly enough for charities and nonprofit organizations like um, if you're, you're a part of a fraternity or a professional fraternity in the university and you're doing like a poker night fundraising for uh, you know uh, mental health awareness and those type of charities those are regulated by federal entities, both the Bureau of Gambling Control and Department of Justice. So no state entities, no state agency, not even the governor, uh, maybe a little bit in, in some way, but not directly. Uh, two federal agencies are monitoring and regulating the charities here in California, which is kind of weird. Makes sense for a few of them, like 50-50 um, raffles for major league teams. So once again, like, because California doesn't have a developed system, I think, around esports and those industries, specifically in California, we're missing out on a lot that's going toward just the federal government. Uh, and maybe it's too late to change that, or maybe we can amend the Constitution to have a little bit more regulation, because there could be a a lot of potential for the esports betting to have a, uh, a little bit better effect on California public works, but. We'll see whether or not that money is used efficiently is another issue. Um, but 90% um, of those funds that the charity makes has to go toward the charity they intended. They're allowed to take 10% and or uh, to, for our normal operations. Uh, and that's outlined in a statute concerning just that charity. And uh, if you guys read the report, I, I put that exact statute in there. All right. Uh, I put some important historical dates. As I said earlier, uh, horse racing has been a while, around for a while, 1933. Uh, I put in a few other important ones in there, like the Indian Reorganization Act. That's like a really hard case for uh, the Native Americans, which says that if you have to be federally recognized by 1934 to be a federally recognized tribe, there's a lot of colluded and unfortunate things about that, but. Uh, not the topic of today's stream. Uh, there's also a huge um, changes to policy between 76 and 99, uh, specifically about the creation of you know gambling control commissions. They're t taking it more seriously, especially uh, after not a lot more people are coming back from the war, uh, spending money going to leisurely activities. But in the California Constitution, it wasn't like a huge thing that a uh, gambling culture could foster until 1999-2000 where we actually amended the constitution for class, class 3 gambling licenses and um, we'll get into those what those mean later uh, but basically it, it, it just means you can have the highest tier of uh, gambling varieties in your establishment so like card rooms and stuff they don't even have a class 3 but casinos definitely have a class 3 they can have everything slots, baccarat, 21, poker, all that so I have a few definitions that are important for like uh, legal meanings on um, gaming and gambling. This is where like video games really come into a little bit of gray area. Gaming is legally defined as skill based, whereas gambling is legally defined as wager based. So when you have video games where it's skill based, get some of the rewards and the free to play stuff, 
but also it's wager based when you unlock loot boxes and do the other points of the gotcha that is where like the lines are blurred and a lot of uh, cases that involve these video game industries they argue well uh it's a skill-based idea to get like uh, farm primo gems or play for in-game content and then you can use that as a free-to-play wager you don't necessarily have to you know play uh, pay for all your gotcha summons and stuff like that so the line is a little bit blurred for that as well as um you know playing for loot boxes or when you level up you get a loot box and stuff like that but it used to be most of loot boxes they weren't free to open you had to pay 250 for them csgo and tf2 especially and steam's been around for a really long time so they've received a little bit of flack for it but it's been so ingrained i think in gaming culture that these games are like you know hallmarks of their age that we, do, we don't bat an eye but like re retrospectively that's it, it was a huge problem that uh, they're making new games on it like i know csgo is making a second game so maybe maybe that model changes we'll see uh, banking games is uh, any game that involves a bank or percentage play. Uh, poker is a big example of it. Um, percentage games specifically that don't involve a bank uh, is one where a house takes a percentage of the bets. So that's another variation of poker. 21 is also that. Uh, Paramutual wagering is where you see in like horse racing and stuff like that, uh, where the bets are placed in a pool and then distributed based on the odds. I believe also normal racing uh, racing betting like for NASCAR and stuff like that is also on a similar system. But there are a few video games that do operate on parimutuel wagering systems. And uh, some of them also involve like, you know, I, a few CSGO betting websites have parimutuel wagering based on odds and how likely it is for a team to win. League of Legends does too, I forget which site it is. And those have been around for a while. Like I remember in high school, my friends were still betting on like CSGO stuff. And like when they were VPNing to other states, they were at the ages where it was legal to do so. So, you know, no violation of the legalities there. Um, fixed odd wagers are when bets are placed in a pool and a final payout is agreed. Um, and those like, you're, you're just uh, playing against fixed odds. Uh, that's what most sports bettings operate on and if they are sports betting apps most of them are fixed odds wagers just because uh parimutuel wagering can get really out of hand in terms of if your uh, company isn't able to sustain the system uh, without many cash flows uh and video game microtransactions it's not actually legally defined but it has come up in a lot of cases where uh you try to debate the definition so in my definition that i've like created from a string of different cases uh, it's the digital obtaining of a good or service of monetary value in a video game the key thing is monetary value because there is no transaction if it's just an in-game item you had to have spent money to get that skin you had to spend money to get that key to unlock that loot box if you had to buy the loot box in the first place if you had to buy the skin it's all a microtransaction some of them you had to obtain through gambling but some of them are like um you were incentivized to get it through a predatory practice and or that was the business model of the game and that's kind of how I see video game microtransaction and kind of the whole scheme of all this. Uh, we have a few more gambling definitions in the back, but these are kind of like the main uh, meat of the sandwich for the policy and how they try to conceptualize these video games when they come to gambling regulation in California. Uh, a few things more on the class one, two and three gambling licenses. Uh, class one gambling is any gambling activity that is intended to be social or ceremonial. So you have, you know, your social game with friends, you're playing a game of poker in like your friend's buddy's basement. You know, that's not illegal. The police aren't going to come and arrest you for that. Uh, if you're playing, you know, uh, gambling games in your tribal community, that's OK. If you're playing a religious game that involves gamblings or wagers, that's OK. You know, you don't need a license for that. That's class one gambling. Uh, feel free to do so. It does come a problem, though, if you try to make it a business of yours and you have a room or an establishment that just does illegal poker and sanctioning. Oh, thank you for stopping by, Faye. Hope you have a good one. Thank you, thank you for wishing a good educational stream. But yeah, big stinky brain hours. We are massive five head today. But yeah, uh, class one gambling requires no license. Um, class two gambling, however, is, you know, when you have start having a business related around it such as your card rooms 
of your casinos and whatnot. And those often contain banking and percentage card games. Uh, card rooms are the greatest example in California. Um, they require a county license. Note that um, you can have a banking or percentage card game in a video game. You don't need a license for that, which is really weird. Uh, and then classroom gambling includes all the gambling machines and ideas that we said. Uh, it requires a compact with the state. Now the compact isn't just, you know, legal agreement saying, yeah, you're okay to open a casino. They do take um, into effect and into account a huge variety of different factors when they uh, do a compact with you. Such as stating they might have a compact of 10 years and say within those 10 years, you might need to donate a certain amount of your revenue to public works for you to have this gambling uh, f facility in the middle of a giant populated area. Sacramento has done that with um, Cash Creek Casino. Uh, that is, I think it's led by the Yochi Dehi Wantun Nation of tribes. Uh, they're, they're, they're a pretty cool tribe. And they do donate a certain amount of public works and um, I think part of their compact as well is that the more they donate, they can either donate to overall the state or do a lesser amount and just do local governments and local um, counties and jurisdictions that are around them and help regulate them. And they'll have the option of having more uh, slot machines. So in those, com those compacts are really important. The fact that that could delineate um, how much gambling these class three establishments can do because all, all casinos probably need a class three establishment unless your casino only has banking and percentage games and in that case you're pretty basically a card room but more often we'll see uh, we'll see the casinos having class three licenses as I said previously you don't need a class one two or three to operate a gambling mechanic in uh, a video game considering it's part of the model and a lot of the arguments that video game companies make is that the game itself you don't need to spend money to play it for the free-to-play models and otherwise the the wit the good or skin or hat you get from the game that's not direct money and there is no facility or service that you can make direct money off of it so we have huge problems when you have things like the Steam Market, <laughs> where you unbox a CSGO skin and you can immediately go sell it for tens of thousands of dollars. That's a huge problem. But Steam makes the argument that while it's localized on our platform, you don't turn it into tens of thousands of dollars that goes directly into your bank account. You can only spend it on the Steam Market. So it's considered in quotes, you know, an in-game good still. You just have to spend a little bit of money to unbox the crate. But here's the weird, weird thing is that you do have the ability to take these skins and go sell it and turn it into real financial money. And that's true with most gotcha games as well. The account itself has value. A gotcha game may argue that, you know, it's all the uh, goods that you get localized in game, but the gotcha it's account itself has value. Like, in fact, you can go online and get league accounts with lots of champ, all the champions. You got gotcha your accounts with certain characters on it. I know Ganyu and uh, Ganyu accounts are very popular when Genshin first started. Ching accounts and whatnot. You can basically, you know, buy, sell your account as well as a form of money. So there is a direct form of money being made. It's not within the sanction of the game company, but there should be a little bit of an accountability where a game company should know this and be like, oh, it's not a problem anymore. They accepted TOS. Because in most of these games, TOS, it says, oh, I will not sell my account, but no one reads the TOS. So it's, you know, the, the law has no value since people don't follow it. But anyway, uh, I took through a few other countries, their stances of video games, especially I wanted to include China and Japan because they are huge, um, huge centers for these gacha games especially they, they have a different culture around them and it's a lot different than america so the way they handle things in their terms of policy system 
I think California and America as a whole can also like learn a bit or two. Except Bel Belgium is very, very strict on its gambling. They're, they're just no gambling whatsoever. They do be well then, so. Uh, probably not copying them if we wanted to keep a few of the gambling varieties awake. But um, we're gonna take a small break here, uh, get some water, use the bathroom and stuff. Uh, we'll be back in like a few minutes. Uh, but after the break, we'll be talking more about um, uh, the gotcha game policies from other countries. Be right back. Let's see if my intermission screen actually still works. Oh, nice. Nice. Look at that. I haven't streamed in a while, so I'm making sure all the buttons work. But uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Make sure to grab water, get some snackies. We'll be back later with more uh, international politics.
variety we have returned. Uh, so we were last just talking about uh, gambling policy from other countries. And the big ones I've selected are Japan and China, and then the Netherlands and Be Belgium. Because we got uh, not only a chron chronology, but I also wanted to get two contrasting opinions from the countries that have huge gambling cultures, as well as two countries that have huge um, anti-gambling cultures. So in Japan, big, big like El Dorado for the gacha game industry in general. They actually have a consumer affairs industry where their um, gacha laws are actually under business and consumer laws rather than gambling laws. So it's at that point in that country where they have it under, you know, normal every day to day uh, engagements. And they actually have quite strict gambling um, gambling provisions and gambling regulations and rules, despite the fact that it's high amount of accessibility. But I think with the culture, there is a little bit more awareness to of like different facets of gaming and people not spending outside their means in order to play their games, especially their gacha games. But if you go to Tokyo, there's, you know, pachinko parlors and casinos located down the street from schools and stuff. So it's a little bit more intermingled uh, in some of the more dense Japanese societies. But I feel like uh, it's a little bit different than the way we view it here in America. But in 2012, their consumer affairs agency uh, bans complete gotchas. So their complete gotchas are classified as unjustifiable premiums and misleading representation. So that's why they have um, a lot of the rates known, as well as what uh, heroes you can obtain in those gotcha games. Think FGO, think uh, all of those where it shows you the list and percentages of what you could obtain. Because it used to be in complete gotcha games, they would just say chance of this, chance of that, and then they don't list the rates and you just go for it. FGO did that for a little bit, but now they have to show the rates, now they have to show the percentages. And um, some countries still develop complete gotchas. Uh, I can't think of an example where there's a complete gotcha that's like in a triple A game, mostly because it's like very, very contested territory and they probably wouldn't try it. But uh, partial gotchas are now like kind of the legal definition in Japan where you have lots of gameplay and then uh, a justified gacha premium where uh, they say you can free to play grind for some of these saint courts or primo gems but you can still purchase for guaranteed wagers and or whatnot but the pity system is not a legally enforced thing it's just something that they use to entice more people to play the game where Mahoyo has, you know, the $200 USD threshold for your five five star SSR. That is their threshold that they decide to make money at for your guarantee. Um, they also show your rates. They also show what you rolled previously. Loot boxes are not the same as that, but it's uh, it's weird for some games because some games have to uh, you have to play the game or get level up and get XP for their loot crates. But then also, they don't, some games don't offer you the ability to open that loot box without paying. CSGO, TF2 comes to mind. Overwatch, much more generous, which is, I think, very strange that Overwatch was the first to get banned in certain countries. Their loot boxes are free. Their loot boxes are extremely generous. You get them like once per level and you only need to play a few games, but. I digress. Overwatch should completely remove them to be more uh, globally friendly. Uh, China itself, where uh, only very recently had it uh, a lot where you had to publish your gacha rates. And you also had to publish the rates of the loot boxes, which is, I think, something really, really new. And if you take the context of it, I, it's most likely because of Overwatch and Hearthstone, in China specifically, because those two games were very popular in that region. Um, League of Legends, not so much, and I don't see the Western games applying to it that much. I don't know when Valorant came out, but it could be um, because of Valorant as well. And Valorant itself does not even uh, do loot boxes. They do they do skins and uh, battle passes, I believe. I don't play that game, but I think that's uh, how they do it. They do it similar to League of Legends, but League of Legends also has loot boxes. It's weird, but you can justify playing the whole thing free to play. And they really get you with the skins and stuff, but 
their gotcha rates are known, they're published, and that's specifically for games developed in China. Um, I'm not sure if they also want uh, other games when they're in China to be played to have uh, gotcha rates be published. But I can also assume that uh, with the political context of China, they would uh, most likely have the power to ban a game if it doesn't have a justifiable gotcha representation and they don't have gotcha rates known, uh, such as I think CSGO could fall under that category, but it may not be at the top of the legislative um, interest for the Chinese legislation. Uh, the Netherlands in 2018, very, very, very recently, um, they determined that their loot box uh, and if it has a market value that you can get from the loot box, uh, it is flat out gambling and you need a gambling license in order to have those loot boxes developed in your game. So a lot of games come under flack for this because not every company has gambling licenses. So that could be like, you know, it admits to the fact that you're, you know, actively promoting gambling in your game. Um, so Overwatch is definitely taking a lot of flack in the Netherlands. And then Belgium itself, uh, part of Belgium law is that loot boxes are flat out considered gambling. It's within their uh, laws and statutes that uh, they're one of the few EU countries that just have flat out banned loot boxes. And they say you can only have, uh, we, can, we can only play your game in our country if you have a loot box alternative, like in a Belgium Apex Legends, you can scrap the loot box for crafting materials. But if you don't, the game is banned in Belgium. So I feel like that is the strongest stance we have here in terms of uh, gambling policy regulations to fix. Uh, the Chinese policy where you need to have gotcha rates known, it's a little less misleading. I believe, especially if you're publishing the rates. And um, I know a lot of people that play the Mahoyo games, they're like, well, I'm close to the $200 threshold, might as well spend it. And they're knowing they're going to spend the 200 and at least get a five star. They know what their pity's at and stuff like that. So they can make a little bit more educated decision on what they're going to do. With stuff like CSGO, you don't know when the next time you're going to hit like the skin you want. You don't know the threshold of what you're going to when you're going to get the next knife. It's all up to chance. Overwatch kind of in the same way, but the Overwatch chests are really good. Ironically, which brings up another point. I think this is more of the opinion side than an academic like analysis, but Overwatch has been super generous with their loot boxes. Very strange that they were the first to get hit. Most likely because of their global prominence at the time. Might have been just the uh, first guy in line that got shot. But I think also the Japan uh, complete gotcha really sets a really good foundation for I think how uh, gotcha regulation should be in places like California where if you're a California game developer and you do create like a gambling platform or a gotcha game, you should not have a misle misleading representations. You should have unjust file premiums. That's just good business practice for, you know, a gotcha game. But also it creates a certain transparency where you can clearly show the intent of your game to the government. It's like we can see in games like Overwatch that, you know, the loot boxes are there to make money, but they're also there to, you know, make a good experience with the players to get them skins and stuff like that, support the creators, support the designers, support the game devs. Um, in terms of the Netherlands, Belgium, they're kind of like, I, I do agree that some companies definitely need a gambling license if their whole premise of live service is that they're making money off of loot boxes. I'm not sure how uh, Apex Legends makes a lot of their revenue, but I'm assuming it's loot boxes, skins and whatnot. There should be, I think, a license for that or a com commercial um, gambling license or a wager. I think Steam needs should probably also have one now because they literally have a live service market and they have like, you know, bullshit TOSs and chat boxes to like defer blame and stuff like that. But I think uh, with that, I think regulation in California, I think we'd have a little bit better of a uh, change in terms of underage gambling and, you know, having kids know what uh, they're getting into. You know, uh, having telling your kid, hey, games are got the gambling is bad. Don't get addicted to it. You know, only go so far. You know, when they're playing, uh, let's say CSGO for seven hours a day and they're just around loot boxes all the time. They want to open one every now and then to see all their cool friends have skins and stuff. But 
In this slide, I kind of detail a little bit about the problem gambling and gaming. Uh, I talk a lot about Overwatch, but there's this huge expansion of game building varieties in California, not just like in terms of the state lottery, in terms of online gambling. The video games have like a lot of softcore gambling elements. You know, you have your free loot boxes from League of Legends, which is oddly enough sponsored by Amazon, which actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. But you know, in, in a some sense, Amazon is sponsoring gaming, uh, gambling, that is, with these uh, free loot boxes. Uh, but the fact that, you know, endorsing your loot boxes, uh, you're having morally okay loot boxes, that's another cause of concern, because I think when you start spinning it toward a positive light, uh, you have a little bit of, you know, a great moral gray area where you're endorsing, or you're getting kids into gambling activities or gambling behavior. Uh, and then uh, th from there, it's like, they could develop potentially more damaging uh, gambling problems. But the what I was talking about with 50-50 raffles earlier, there could be a potential huge problem for uh, major major league esport games that will then have, uh, say if we have legalized esports betting, when they have raffles at their games, we have p people spending huge amounts of money there. Um, you know, we have IAM Oakland, we have Akatoviche, we have the uh, League Championship Series, we have Overwatch League. There's a lot of potential for that to go wrong as an unregulated space. It's essentially like free market almost. Of course, you have the California State Lottery. Once you're 21, you can buy your, as much scratchers as you want. You can buy as many lottery tickets as you want. And also video game microtransactions, because I feel like a lot of people don't um, count that as gambling, especially like when you have a battle pass and then the whole point of the content is you you play it to get all the rewards. But then what happens when you get loot boxes as far as your, uh, your battle pass rewards? Then then they're kind of dangling the care in front of you, saying, hey, play the game a bit more. We'll reward you with some gambling. You have become satisfied with your gambling results. And you can buy more loot boxes, which I find a little bit, a little bit weird, but that's one of the emerging problems, I think, that's coming into our policy sphere. Uh, one of the other problems is the emergence of special interest monopolies. This is a politicized topic of whether or not you consider a casino a special interest monopoly or these tribal groups to be special interest monopolies. I'm just presenting the facts as uh, the recent election data showed. Uh, but Prop 26 in 2022 for California, uh, there was huge funding from the tribal groups to try to get it to pass because they would legalize uh, sports betting within their casinos. And because um, they are unlike card rooms and horse race tracks, they get huge winnings off of this. Now, they had huge cash contributions in order for this uh, bill to pass. And actually, I think it was over 70% of what the opposition had. So it's very strange that not only uh, did this fail, but it shows that California is split morally between um, two sides of we want to support Native Americans. California is very big on supporting Native Americans, but they're also anti-gambling. So they're in a little bit of a crossroads between what group they want to support. And it seems the American uh, California public is more anti-gambling than it was supporting tribal groups. And you can debate whether or not um, the tribes, like only the top 2% of tribes are the ones that are like making the most. But also plain fact of the matter that there is huge amounts of revenue within these tribal groups, and they have a lot of political power. As we can see here, 131 billion in cash contributions, huge amount of money just throw around for uh, trying to get bills to pass and push through the legislature and you know raise money, add campaigns, getting voters to the booth and whatnot. Quite, quite heated. So these groups have a lot of power and a lot of resources, and I think if there was more vested interest, there could be a more complex and sophisticated policy system, considering how much money is being thrown around. But another problem, as I talked earlier, the flaws of overlapping jurisdiction between all these agencies and all these cash flows. A lot of the cash flow goes toward the administrative costs, but when they say they go to public works, welfare, state general fund, not clear. It's just that all these money, all this money goes toward them. Uh, the developing nations aren't also clear. 
as I said earlier, the $3.6 million that go to tribes and stuff like that, of that $8 billion they initially got from revenue, some tribes are like paying them, paying themselves like normal wages. Other tribes like um, Red Hawk Casino, for example, paying their members like $30,000 a month. And that's not an exaggeration. So there's a little bit of inequity of how these um, public work revenues and all the uh, welfare that's supposed to be allocated to, it's not clear where or how um, it's broken down very well. And I would make this table more detailed if I had the information to do so. But you know, there's a lot of paywall, a lot of the companies and private groups, they also charge for you to see their budgets and price breakdowns. So that's another thing about, you know, uh, in terms of the overlapping jurisdiction where, you know, if we have $830 million that goes towards uh, the administrative costs of the California State Lottery, how much goes actually to the uh, Lottery Commission? How much goes to the governor? And also, uh, if, you, if you live in California, and this is probably true of every state, most people will say that their public work revenue is not allocated efficiently. And like, I, I put this these uh, quotes here, go outside and drive 12 feet without hitting a pothole. If you guys have driven through El Camino in California, Jesus, oh my God, it is like a, a battlefield of World War One. There's been potholes there since like I, I, I've been born. Quite the wild ride. But uh, in terms of the overlapping jurisdiction as well, huge weird problem with separation of powers and the fact that um, we have both state agencies and federal agencies regulating within our space. They need to be there for some of them, of course. Rebel gambling is one of them, but the California specific ones and like, uh, like how, uh, the horse racing and the state lottery, I feel like there should be at least one, you know, agency that's in charge of just all gambling in California. It might overburden it, but then that creates the, the idea that you could expand the California Gambling Control Commission. As the California Gambling Control Commission, you would figure uh, would be in charge of all gambling facets in California, but that's for uh, some of my policy recommendations after. So this one actually comes from uh, my research from Native American Affairs and that there's a little bit of a jeopardy of tribal self-sufficiency, because as I mentioned, there's a large, uh, huge dip and valley of uh, very wealthy tribes, and very poor tribes. This is the um, uh, the Yokut Nation, uh, San Joaquin Valley here in uh, Stockton, California. They, they have a powwow every Labor Day. It's very epic, but there is a declining renewal of tribal compacts for those trying to get casinos uh, on their land. because It seems that the anti-gambling sentiments is uh, bleeding over into the current legislature. So there's uh, a lot less options for tribes to actually make financial uh, self-sufficiency on their land. So big problem if their lands are like in the middle of the desert and you can't turn into farmland, can't turn into any uh, livable space. And that is a currently huge modern problem. As I said, 2023, you can go to a reservation, there's no running water or electricity, which is a little bit absurd. And then the state has no vested interest in trying to improve their uh, quality of life conditions because it's foreign land. Uh, they do have the revenue sharing trust fund where uh, the more wealthy tribes are to donate to less economically unfortunate tribes. Oh, ooh, how's it going, Zayn? Welcome, welcome. How you doing? Do you play any gotcha games, by the way? That'd be the topic of today's stream. Oh, yeah, this still stink. Yeah, the... Uh, uh, more wealthy tribes are supposedly supposed to donate certain amounts of money, but the some very wealthy tribes have won court cases where they've legally argued their way out of trying to donate to that fund. And they have the legal resources to do so. Smaller tribes ne don't necessarily have those legal resources to make sure they get those money. Um, and there's shifting views of narrow American rights between administrations. Obviously, if you have a more right of center uh, group, they might be a little less pro anti -Amer uh, Native American and more left to center politicians and administrations may have better views uh, toward Native Americans favoring them. So it does, it might shift in the next few years, especially um, between different administrations. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
big lag hours. You know, the anti-gambling sentiment within America and California itself uh, definitely hurts those tribes that try to start larger casinos. And as I said, with the larger casinos trying to get out of um, payments and stuff, the whole revenue sharing trust fund, it could be re revamped so that the percentage is either lower for those groups or there's a larger uh, incentive for their donations to be. Because um, as I said earlier, Cash Creek Casino, they're allowed to have more uh, slot machines in their casino if they give more money to Sacramento and Yolo County. So food for thought, something they could possibly do. So the future of gotcha games in California, I put this big question mark here because I kind of want to debate it, talk to you guys, to what your guys' thoughts on it. But for me, I think that it's in a weird space where California companies will not start willingly got willingly start gotcha games. It's going to be mainly the overseas companies like Mahoyo. Uh, I can't think of other gotcha games. Nintendo as well. They make a lot of gotcha games. They're going to be making a lot in California, and then it's not going to be a while, maybe next five years or a decade where our generation is in the California legislature actively making rules about this. And there could be a lot of developments in the next five to 10 years where they're going to have more exploited practices, different exploited practices. And all in all, I think we're not going to turn to Belgium just because I, I believe American businesses love to make money and they want to have profit off of it. But there are ways to do so in, w in which the game can exist here and we can make money off of it. Such as the idea that like, you know, you when you go purchase a uh, when you purchase rolls in you know, Fire Emblem Heroes or any of the other Nintendo gotcha games, you go through the Google Play Store and you actually have the service fee, you have your tax that that tax goes to Google California, right? Gundam Battle Operation 2. Oh, is that a gotcha game? I'm assuming Japanese publisher. Oh, does it have does it have bad rates or does it have um exploited practices? Feel free to put your uh your opinions on it. We can dissect it a bit. But I think for the future of gotcha games in California, we're definitely gonna see a little bit more of games that have either need to innovate their practice in terms of like what Overwatch did where they switched to a different model instead of loot boxes and skins. They still have skins, but they don't necessarily um, actively do loot box. But the games that do have gotcha in them and where you do have to roll for your uh, characters. I can't believe I haven't mentioned Arknights and stuff, but those companies, they're gonna need to find a way where it's clear gotcha, the rates are established, and you need to have a free to play system in order for people to play it. And it is never going to be, oh shit, all around, oh god. There's never going to be a situation, I think, where there's going to be an active market for these said gotcha games for your digital goods. So Steam is really going to be the big, uh, big player in that. The fact that it's going to be the only, I think, provider for the next, you know, five or ten years that will keep its Steam market and be able to justify the fact that you can sell your your CSGO skins, your Steam commute, your Steam marketables for, for Steam money, which can be turned into real money, but that's beside the point. As long as those terms of services stay um, and say that it's not on the fault of you and they don't officially sponsor a, you know, a skins company or a sports betting company, I think it's going to be very unfortunate. Um, but... Every time you get 10 drop, I get the same weapons and the same three suits, so none of which are good. Oh, oh, exploited gambling practices. Actually, we had a slide about that. I'll post, I'll post this uh, later. But in 2012, Japan actually outlet, um, outlawed unjustifiable premiums and misleading representation in their complete gotchas, which I find funny. And then China in 2016 made it a law that you have to have your gotcha rates known. I find that funny that those experiences are kind of synonymous with gotcha games. Big rip. But yeah, um, I think there could be an opportunity though for esports betting. Even though sports betting didn't take off, the esports betting like leagues, if they do fixed wage, um, fixed odds wagers, that could be like, I think a very controlled way 
So they do paramutual wagering. That's going to be that's going to be a shit show, especially in League of Legends. And you know, half the half, most of the uh, professional teams are overseas, and ALCS only has three in the World Championship and whatnot. Only sends one to MSI. The amount of wages is going to be very condensed with the, the smaller amount of teams. It's going to be a little bit different in CS:GO where there's tons of teams. Uh, some of them by nationality, some not. It's the only other Gundam shooter, so no option to play. Oh, that that is unfortunate. It do be unfortunate. But yeah, in terms of, uh, I think Gotcha Games in California, we really, I think, missed the ball in terms of trying to be a policy leader. We do have the ability to become a policy leader, but until then, I think a lot of game companies are not going to develop in uh, California should they want to create uh, a Gotcha Game as a model or their main model of revenue. See, I, I'm also not sure if um, maybe someone in the industry can answer this better. If uh, games like Mahoyo's games or the gotcha games are specifically made to be profited off of gambling. Because I know League of Legends, you could say it's not. Um, CSGO, uh, maybe because uh, you get to purchase the game itself. Overwatch, you get to purchase the game itself. Oh, more suits than kind of Overwatch. Big unfortunate. Yeah, as we can see, oh, and then oh, there's the FIFA games and all those series and the, the gambling mechanics in them. Those, those are a little weird, too, because I feel like those are a lot of softcore gambling mechanics, but they're disguised. And, uh, you know, if you consider things like baseball trading cards, those have been in America for forever. Like people, your parents won't bat an eye if you spend like a little bit of money to get some of those. But, you know, for a gotcha game, like you spend 200 bucks for a five star in Genshin Impact, then it becomes a little bit more suspicious. Then we have a little bit more of a problem. But uh, I have a few uh, policy recommendations. Um, some of them to kind of steer around uh, the problems that we have, as well as some of the trying to synchronize with uh, what the California public interests are. So one of my policies for change is a local tribal education act, where we can improve the self-sufficiency of smaller tribes through local tribal education with their local school districts. Um, this is a way for the tribe to make money without them needing to make a casino. So we've steered completely away from the gambling policy and we'll have local schools incorporate local tribal history and their K to through all a, a curriculum. There's successful models of these already happening in California where elementary schools will go and visit their local uh, Native American tribe and the tribe will have special areas specifically for education so that museum exhibits, local tribal demonstrations, or they'll go and come to schools. And I think that was a really good way to not only increase their tribal self-sufficiency, but they could use um, some of their TGNF money to have established cultural heritage sites, or if they want privacy, this is the public space and this is their private space, or delineation. And that money could also go toward hiring educational instructors within their tribe, paying their educational instructors, encouraging tribal members to go in toward higher education and becoming feeling have safe job security being a historian within their tribe a little biased because you know history degree but also creating more educational programs uh within the in cooperation with those tribes you once spent 200 dollars in gbo2 to barely get any suits and banners oh man are the rates really bad in gbo2 That, that sounds atrocious, truly. If, would you say from that experience that uh, you've been de, uh, de incentivized from playing other gacha games? I know for me, after like I played FGO, I was like much more F2P playing the games. I'd be like, I'm, I'm in it for the grind. I'm not gonna spend 200 for guarantees. But yeah, that's one of my um, proposals to, uh, increase this tribal self-sufficiency of local tribes. Uh, they can also do things like charging dues or charging a museum admission to view their collections and stuff like that. Uh, something that will not conflict with the uh, anti-gambling sentiments of California, but still synchronize with the pro-Indian sentiments that California public has. Another one, a reorganization plan for the California gambling agencies. Because holy crap, that's a lot of agencies regulating gambling in California. So having a unified California gambling regulatory system 
uh, evaluating as well within the statute the role that the agency has in their active regulation. Because I guarantee you, the DOJ is not at a casino every day making sure that um, compliance is happening with tribal casinos. They're brought in as they're brought in, I think, with you know any other tribe, but I feel like it shouldn't be all vested in the DOJ having a fourth of the power in the casino. Drops have both weapons and suits in there as six times the number of weapons are. Ah, ah, so there's a little bit of misleading representation with all the items, big rip. But also, uh, not only evaluating the rules to see if they should be there, con consolidating everything into the California Gambling Control Recomm um, Commission. It might, the, 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 the right, this agency itself may not have the sustainability or resources to do so, but having in statute giving it that authority and consolidating it as under departments, and those departments have operate like the same way they did, it's just a different structure. I think that could be a little bit more successful than having this show. Because, like, once Congress, uh, the California legislature, creates a rule, creates a law, and then in the statute they go and create a new agency, then we're gonna have even more problems if this is their current approach and they just keep making more and more agencies or commissions to oversee one single gambling facet. Because I don't want there to be like 20 different video game agencies to regulate gotcha games, loot boxes, and stuff like that. Because I feel like that's a little bit of a waste of just a general fund. As Whereas, you know, you can give an $800 million budget to the California Gambling Control Commission it divides out to their uh, departments. Berserk Fear hasn't arrived, big sad. Oh, because oh, it was supposed to come today, right? Does the tracking number say if it's uh, close or not? Or uh, at least within your state? And also, one thing that I feel like should be a little bit better in California is the reliance on state agencies over federal. Uh, it, it's still very weird that some businesses are purely regulated uh, in, the, in a federal sense that you as a governor or you as a mayor can have a bunch of federal agencies in your town regulating a business that you you profit off of directly and having that those uh, just having a bit more uh, ability for local and county organizations to be able to uh, not only profit but uh, regulate their own entities in their in their cities because they they sign compacts they sign licenses the agency should be within uh, the locals. Right now, I left Cali around three today. Dang. Do you know if you have like weekend deliveries where you are? I wonder. I, I do wonder if it'll uh, it'll come on a weekend. It's possible. Could happen. You never know. You never know. Uh, but my last policy for change is uh, a Problem Gaming Information Act. So not directly creating a public policy saying no gacha game, no mahoyo, but uh, having uh, a statute and regulate or regulation that promotes more active research into microtransactions and the effects of underage gambling, maybe through the California Gambling Control Commission, maybe through Cal Problem Gamers, it's a nonprofit, and. Because the, the main target, the, the people that like spend a lot of money is like kids that don't know any better. And it's like, you know, the credit card companies that like, uh, sorry, when they exploit those kids and they like have those gotcha rates and you know, you have to search them for a bit or the characters are really cool in a video game and like, you know, parents dismiss it because, you know, oh, my kid's just having fun in the game. Why is there a $200 credit card bill? But increased outreach programs and grants given to problem gaming nonprofits so that they can, uh, have the further resources in order to promote um, the idea of problem gaming information and try to stem the flow because a lot of what Cal PG does, Cal Problem Gamers, is um, uh, help people that have like chronic addiction of gambling at a casino. So by overlap, I think it should also incorporate underage gambling as well, or at least I would hope so. Um, as well as also pressure stakeholders from the No on 26 campaign, all those anti-gambling uh, parties and special interest groups, they have a lot of money. <laughs> and I think with a little bit of that sway, there could be a little bit more money that goes towards in, uh, education in this field. There's also not a lot of academic literature. Like of the academic literature review I did, the more prominent ones, there's like one article from NYU, uh, 
uh, one from private law firms and another just, you know, the rest are video game journalism. So the fact that those are our three points of contact for this topic, that means there's huge potential, I think, for gambling legislation and gaming legislation for video game microtransactions to develop. Now, I, I've dinged California for being not very good at its uh, gambling regulation policies and having it being fragmented, but there's still an opportunity, I think, for California to be an emerging policy front and policy leader for it, to have a very sophisticated policy system that's nuanced, but also not fragmented and still functioning. Because we have states like New Jersey and Nevada that have very strong gambling cultures within their states, and um, you know they don't have uh, as large of a problem as California does in terms of some of its gambling problems. And maybe that has to do with our population. Maybe that has to do with our uh, different cultures per region of California. There might be there's a ton of different factors, but the bottom of the fact is that they also have a lot of also problem gaming information, you know, banner ads, bus ads, television ads that play. I think more of an attention to that uh, in relation to all these uh, gotcha games coming out brings more awareness. And I think you can make the argument where, oh, those private companies or like Mahalia are gonna start also doing counter counter ads to uh, you know promote that their games are uh, exploitive for gambling. Like if you go to San Francisco, there's freaking Genshin ads everywhere. But the idea that problem gaming information should really be going out to these underage kids as well as young adults that, you know, might be coming out of college, uh, might be uh, getting their first few jobs and be able to afford tons of money. In general. Oh, that is indeed very expensive. But yeah, I think also incorporating it into an academic literature field. Uh, would increase the uh, yeah a little bit better area of study as well as kind of encourage better academic debate on the topic and uh, that is my last uh, policy recommendations I uh, thank you guys for listening for making it this far we came here for five minutes we came here for the full hour 40 uh, but yeah any questions I love talking about gotcha games and gambling regulation moment I know uh, Zane was talking about GBO2 earlier. And I know a few games that had like really bad pity systems. And I'd be interested to see if um, certain games would adopt a better system because there's a law about it. Because FGO has no pity, FGO has bad rates. It's like 1% no pity. And there's tons of servants you can get. And uh, you have to grind like months for you to get like enough rolls to get someone. And the fact that I think China has the uh, policy where you have to share your gacha rates and Japan says you have to ban complete gachas. I think if there is gambling regulation, uh, GBOT also has no pity system, unfortunate. I think it's big unfortunate that, uh, you know, pit pity isn't a force. I know that it's like per game company. Maybe they really need those, uh, the extra revenue, but Having a law or legislation in place where you're incentivizing a pity system, or at least, you know, a soft pity, telling your rates being transparent, I think would create just overall better, uh, I think, sentiments toward gacha games and stuff. Because it's still, I think, a developing system. It's almost like normative culture in the Bay Area that you play a gacha game, only only enough. But I think it varies between Sacramento. I think LA, there's a ton of people that play gacha games. I mean, you go on to, uh, I haven't, I completely, I haven't talked about Honkai Star Rail yet, but if you go on Twitch, Honkai Star Rail is probably like number one or number two, uh, most stream game right now. They're, they're not going away. And from what I've heard of people there, it's, it's quite addicting in terms of the gameplay. So yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a weird, a, uh, uh, space that we're in where we're kind of living in the transition period where loot boxes are kind of being phased out. Gotcha games still exist from 10 years ago. Uh, Steam market is still alive and thriving. There's never gonna now be an official sanction. Sports betting 
or esports betting site, there's not going to be an official like a CSGO lotto anymore. And whether or not that 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 those sites being officially sanctioned would be good. Oh, you missed the gotcha. Don't worry, there's going to be a VOD. But have you played uh, any gotcha games, Galaxy Pox? Is there a particular one that really irks you? Do you have any opinions on gotcha games? Probably. So I, I know you play Overwatch. I talked a lot about Overwatch today, damn. There, there do be a lot of them. I can go back a bit. Ooh, the Saber Fang. Oh, so 63 bucks, not too bad. Oh, but you know, I was also talking about how uh, in Overwatch, I, I, I still find it weird that Overwatch took the bullet first because they were a game. Oh, 37, not bad, not bad. They took the bullet first, but they had generous loot boxes, tons of skins. You got loot boxes very frequently and you had uh, you had to purchase the game. So, but and then there's games that are like straight up like fake grand order, multi-million dollar game. Mahoyo makes billions of dollars in a few years. And th they don't they don't take the hit. Yeah, it's weird. And then, you know, you have Apex Legends, you have CSGO, which is in TF2 where you have to spend money to unbox their boxes. Weird, right? And you had to buy their game at one point. Like TF2, you had to purchase to have premium effects. CSGO is a, a purchasable game too. So there's like, not only you have the stream of income from game purchase, you have the stream of income from, you have to spend money to unbox. So extremely weird that Blizzard took the hit first. I actually don't know what was the sentimentality about. Maybe it's like a big corpo thing. Maybe there's a lot of negative attention as well because Blizzard's, uh, you know, it's not de dealing very well with sexual harassment cases. It doesn't have a very good track record of that. So maybe there's just more negative international attention for it. But the fact that Blizzard had for Overwatch had to switch from, yeah, the, all the negativity, switch from loot box, Luke's blocks exclusive and game sales for their revenue to battle pass. And whether or not, you know, if it's forced, like, yeah, yeah, supporting China in 2019 when the, the, that one guy said, um, free Hong Kong and Blizzard banning him and all his earnings. Yeah, so it's, it might, it might be more politics with Blizzard in and of itself, but there's a lot of negativity around that one. So maybe it's good that, you know, more Western uh, gotcha games have flown a little bit under the radar for those. Actually, yeah, because I can't think of another Western game that like actively relies on the loot box system for their money. So I know CSGO is still funded on skins. I think CSGO 2 is going to be free to play or something like that, as most games are. League of Legends is uh, loot box skins. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and then uh, emotes and all that, those other goodies. Amazon Prime and whatnot. Valorant is the same way. There's a battle pass and skins. But yeah, maybe that's that's another thing too. I'll, I'll go back to the uh, future game, gotcha games. I, I don't see that Asian gotcha games switching to sk a skins and battle pass model just because they, they do everything. Like uh, there's a battle pass, there's a Welkin in Genshin. They have the gotcha. Call of Duty, uh, I played Modern Warfare 1 and 2 for the new, the 2019 ones. They have, they do battle pass and skins as well. They do them for all their games too, which is a little bit weird for the live service. Yeah, it's also weird when it's pay to win like tabletop card games. But it's also another thing, I, I don't have like a big expertise in the legalities of tabletop card games, but that one's also a little bit exploitive if you have to play to win, or sorry, pay to win and pay for certain cards to be good. Pay for 
you know, in, in some extents, Warhammer is the same way where you have to like monitor game patching so that you know which units are good and whatnot. <clears throat> that one's a little bit more aggressive for, uh, I think, just buying certain models because then there's a whole process uh, added to that. But yeah, I think that's a, a regulation for your business practices. Tabletop card games aren't necessarily pay to win, but is it, um, do you, do you know if there's a, a legality about the fact they do like card packs and stuff, or you have a chance to get good cards, chance to get bad cards, like when you open, open a pack? Or do you think that's just like purely their business practice? And then like, you know, it's flown under the political radar because of like the niche, niche of the hobby. See, I'm willing to bank that it's also a little bit part of like a lot of factors, mostly the niche part. Because I don't know, let's face it, the California legislature doesn't uh, keep up albums or you catch if you think about it. Yeah, you don't know when you when you buy the album if all the songs are going to be good. Let's be like BTS, right? Yeah, that, that's that's another weasel out because they could say, oh, the, the act aftermarket is not in relation to us. Oh, the concept of photo cards and it's like actually a gotcha whether or not you get them. Because that is te technically gambling if those photo cards have monetary value, right? Same thing, everything pack just card. Well, let's go to the let's go to the gambling definition. So does it fit? Uh, let's see, is it a percentage game? Unboxing the packs. No, the house does not take percentage of the bets. That's true, and it's, uh, uh, it wouldn't be even a microtransaction, it's just a gooder service. And you could argue that, uh, you know, the tabletop card game is skill based itself, so you could, you could just have a uh, build a good free deck. Oh, something interesting. Okay, I, might, I might have to look into that more. Tabletop card game. But yeah, all right. So I'm going to write down a few things. I'm going to ask some industry opinions. People working at Blizzard. Some of my friends. Let's see. Ask industry opinions. And then tabletop card game and their legalities. Actually, I wonder. I wonder if like they have huge legal teams, or if it's just like an afterthought, and they just make sure they like you know they're following all the California laws. Pretty good tournament runs on zero dollar decks. Ooh. See, I wonder too if they like argue for that. They use that as the uh, like grounds of their argument for when they say, "Oh, their game's like you know approachable and uh, not exploitive." So I think under the uh, Japanese definition, where they said unjustifiable premiums and misleading representation, uh, I know I know some some games definitely tread really close to that. Ah, uh, maybe I, I might also uh, do some do some studying for uh, some of my finals coming up. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I, it, the Japanese policy of to, uh, complete gotcha and misleading representation, unjustifiable premiums. I feel like that should just be a baseline in every country's gambling policies. The Magnus, the red decks found around 200 bucks. For, for how many cards was it a lot, a lot of money? And would you say it was like super necessary for the, the deck to be uh, playable stuff like that yeah um you know I, I think china and japan actually have a good idea of make sure you don't have a complete gotcha and have gotcha rates now that's that should be a bare minimum yeah overwatch i think they, they should be able to go back to the loot boxes maybe not uh to the extent that like belgium bans it outright but having like options so they can fit in countries like that, like Apex is able to exist in Belgium because you can scrap the loot box. 
Yeah, it probably it has to be all secondary market. Game company, I'm assuming in terms of legalities, cannot take part in second market. Because then that's active gambling or active um, money to money market value. Yeah, I think that'll be it for today's uh, stream. That was uh, very fun to go through. Um, very, very long time since I've um, been able to go through some of my uh, research in school. Oh, got a notification. But yeah, VOD is going to go up on YouTube as soon as, uh, as soon as it's done processing on Twitch. Very pogs indeed. I uh, will probably do, this is fun. I'll probably do another public policy stream one day. Let's see who's streaming. Let's see here. Ah, oh, my friend's uh, doing custodies. My friend's doing custodies for radio. Yeah, thank you guys for joining me. Uh, we'll be back, I think, next week. Uh, my, my classes are over soon, so I'll have a lot more time to do free time activities and whatnot. Let me queue up the raid. Yeah, a bit more Gundam, do a lot more Dark Angels. Get some more hammer in there. But yeah, thank you guys for joining me here on my socials. Go follow me on my Instagram. I have a food Instagram now where I post food. Discord where we hang out. Uh, and Twitter, we are all, all very active on those socials. Here are the raid messages. Uh, we're gonna go say hi to Handy. He's doing some very nice custody assemblies. All 30,000 points of them in the Horse Heresy. I think it's like 10 models, but basically the same thing. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, we'll prob I'll probably be out this weekend, uh, but stay tuned for next week. And I uh, hope you all have a good rest of your night. Have a good weekend, everyone. Stay stinky.